In this video, we're going to take a deeper look into moment of inertia. Hopefully you recognize the formula stated here that moment of inertia is equal to the integral of r squared dm. I'll give you a reminder where that came from, but you saw it in an earlier video related to rotational kinetic energy. Uh, if we take just a brief look at this formula, I suppose it suggests that the units that we use to measure rotational inertia must be in kilograms times meters squared. Okay, and then all of these formulas you see uh, represent the rotational inertia for different shaped objects, so we'll derive a few of those in this video. Actually, this very first one here needs very little derivation at all, and we'll see that in just a moment. The other two that we'll derive in this video are the rotational inertia of a thin rod, think of like a meter stick or a pencil or something like that, when it's rotated about an axis that passes through its center and it spins around in that direction. And then we'll also imagine what if you took that same rod, meter stick, or pencil and you moved the axis to the end like this and still spin it around in a plane in that direction. So. We'll derive this one at some point as well. Some others we'll derive before this unit of study is over is the rotational inertia of a solid sphere, a spherical shell, and this one they call a solid cylinder about an axis through its center. It doesn't have to be this long of a cylinder. This would be the same thing if we had a much shorter cylinder, which in this point, when it becomes that short, we might refer to it as a disc and we rotate a disk about an axis this way. Its rotational inertia is one half mr squared. So let's get into it and do a brief reminder of where this formula comes from. So rotational kinetic energy is really just the summation of all of the translational kinetic energies of every little pixel, so to speak, that makes up a rotating object. So if we have a disk that rotates with an angular velocity about this central axis, there's a little piece of material here and another piece of material here and another piece of material here. And so we can imagine, as I might have said before, like trying to build a disk uh, out of a bunch of uh, Lego pieces. If we take the bird's eye view, right? There's an eyeball looking straight down the axis of rotation. Then one of our little pieces is here, and another one's here, and another one's here. And they all have a tangential velocity as the disk rotates in this counterclockwise direction. Notice the velocity vector is longest for this piece because it's sitting the farthest away from the axis of rotation. In fact, we've noted that the tangential velocity is the angular speed of the entire disk just multiplied by the value of r um, for any particular piece. So each of these pieces we call dm. They all represent just a little bit of the total mass of the whole disk, capital M. So if we wanted to find what the total translational kinetic energy is associated with all those parts, we would have to add up. In other words, we would have to integrate one-half times dm times v squared. It's just the formula for translational kinetic energy. But once we do this, we stop calling it translational kinetic energy and refer to it as rotational kinetic energy, because after all, the entire disk is not pictured as translating from some point A to some point B throughout its environment. Instead, it's remaining in place as it rotates around an axis. So, uh, in a sneaky way, rotational kinetic energy is really just translational kinetic energy, but the whole, the object as a whole doesn't translate. Just the little parts that make it up seem to be translating due to their tangential velocity. Okay, so we make a substitution. We pull the one half, and we substitute for v uh, squared. We substitute omega r but then the omega r gets squared, right? So we have dm times omega squared times r squared. Every piece has a different value of tangential velocity, but each piece 
shares this common value of omega measured in radians per second. So that comes out of the integral. And we say that the rotational kinetic energy of the entire disk is equal to 1 half times the quantity integral of r squared dm all multiplied by omega squared. And then we just define this as the quantity known as rotational inertia. So we have rotational kinetic energy is 1 half i omega squared. And we note that that formula looks analogous to 1 half m v squared, where rotational inertia is the analog to mass, and angular velocity is the analog to traditional velocity. Okay, so that's what we mean when we say rotational inertia is equal to the integral of r squared dm. So how do we use that basic formula as a starting point to derive all of these different equations? So we'll take the easiest one of all and derive the rotational inertia of a hoop. We might uh, call it a cylindrical shell. A hoop or a ring or a cylindrical shell, those all refer to the same shape. An object whose thickness is very, very small compared to the overall radius. Now, uh, time out. It's important to note that you can never just say, what's the rotational inertia of an object? You always have to say the rotational of an inertia of an object relative to some particular axis of rotation. In other words, if I take this very same ring and choose to rotate it about an axis that goes this way, so I'm rotating it like that, it has a very different rotational inertia than it does when rotated about this axis. Or another example would be if I took this axis and, I don't know, maybe I weld onto here a tiny little ring like this that allows me to pass a rod through it here. And then I rotate this whole thing about this axis. It has a different rotational inertia. So I have to be careful with my language. I can't really say what's the rotational inertia of a hoop. I have to say what's the rotational inertia of a hoop about a central axis. And then we can go even further and say a central axis that lies perpendicular to the plane of the hoop, because I suppose this is also a central axis here. So uh, I'll do my best to be specific, uh, but I'll always draw a diagram to represent exactly what situation I'm talking about. Uh, I've made this a little messy, so let me erase and start over. So once again, here's our cylindrical shell. There's the axis that runs through the center, perpendicular to the plane. And we imagine it's rotating about that axis. All right. So dm, my advice to you is always picture dm make some sort of graphical representation of what the little piece of mass is that you're summing up by taking the integral. So maybe we again show the bird's eye view of this. All right. And once again, we're going to assume that this thickness, T, is not just less than, but much, much less than R. In other words, is R measured to the inner wall, to the outer wall, or to the middle of those two points? Well, if the thickness is really small, it doesn't make a difference. All those values of R would be the same. So that's what we mean when we call it a, a thin-walled cylinder, or a ring, or a hoop, or a cylindrical shell. OK, here's my dm. There we go. We just imagine uh, dividing this up into a bunch of tiny little pieces. We'll make them all a different color if that helps. 
Okay, every one of those can be labeled as dm. So our first dm is at what distance from the axis of rotation? Well, it's at a distance of r. What about our second dm? Uh, it's also at a distance of r. What about the other one? You know what? Every single dm that we picture is all going to have the same value of r. So when we use the formula that says i equals the integral of r squared dm, they all have the same r. So this actually becomes a trivial solution. Trivial in the sense that once we take the r out of the integral sign, and notice I change it from lowercase r to capital R, Anytime you have a value that's constant, uh, we generally express that with a capital letter. So we take the r out of the integral sign, and then we're just left with the integral of dm. And all that's saying is, what do we get? What's the result of adding all these little bits of mass together? Well, when I add those all up, it leads to the total mass of the whole uh, ring. So i for a hoop about the central axis, perpendicular to the plane of the, we'll just call it I hoop for now, um, is equal to m r squared. So let's scroll back up and look at our list of formulas. Ah, that's exactly what's stated here. I equals m r squared.